Uh, my name is Dahi O'Kelly. I'm chair of the UK group in the Institute for International and European Affairs. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to a webinar with Philip Stevens. Uh, Philip Stevens, who is of Irish origin from County Mayo, is the chief political commentator for the Financial Times. Uh, a very influential journalist in the UK for well over 30 years. Uh, and it really is a, a very great pleasure for me to welcome him. Uh, the, the, the webinar is public, it's on the record. And if you have questions as you go along, uh, you can uh, put them and, and, and send them to us and we will put them to Philip afterwards. Uh, the format will be, Philip will talk for 10, 15 minutes, and then he and I will have a discussion for maybe 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open up uh, for questions. So, Philip, the floor is yours. You're most welcome. Dahi, thank you so much for inviting me, and um, thank you for everyone who's um, uh, who's tuned in. I, my only wish is that um, we were I was physically in Dublin uh, as opposed to uh, talking to you all um, uh, through the screens. Um, well, um, to promote my book, it's called um, Britain Alone, uh, The Path from Suez uh, to Brexit. And I wrote it because I thought it was important that Brexit, this sort of decision in some respects out of nowhere in 2016, needed to be seen, at least in British terms, but also internationally, in a, in a, in a wider, longer uh, context, because um, Brexit really is um, uh, a a bookend in a story in in the story of Britain's struggle to um, uh, to find itself to find its place in the world after since the end of the Second World War. I mean, my contention is that for seventy five years now, um, Britain has been trying to work out um, what sort of country, what sort of nation it should be, what it should contribute, what it should expect um, from the international, uh, from its international role. And many of you will um, have heard this famous remark um, made by uh, Dean Acheson, who was uh, Secretary of State to uh, Truman at the end of the war, but also advised Kennedy at the beginning of the 60s. And famously in 1962, um, Atchison rather rebuked uh, Harold Macmillan's government to talk, but he talked about Britain as a nation that had lost an empire um, but failed to find a role. So looking for a role has been, I think, the story. And there have been two, I think, consistent threads in that story. Um, the first, I think, has been the tension between um, our what, what one might say is Britain's exalted ambition and the realities of its new post-war economic and political position. Um, Britain won the war, or at least that's what we told ourselves. We might have given a walk-on part to the uh, Americans and the Soviet Union, but it'd been Britain. Uh, we had um, uh, stood alone uh, against Hitler and won the war. Um, so we should expect to be a remain a great power. It was obvious. Um, but the reality, of course, was that the war um, had bankrupted us. Uh, America had prospered, grown mightily. Um, the Soviet Union had emerged as the other superpower. And uh, we, uh, while still, you know, a significant uh, nation in Europe, a big economy, big industrial base, we had been much diminished um, by the war, relatively speaking, at least, uh, to the United States and the Soviet Union. So here was this first collision between our, our self, um, our image of our self, that we had of ourselves and the realities of um, uh, the world, uh, the world beyond. And the second collision, I think, was has been one between our sense of where we physically, almost geographically, uh, sit in the world. Um, are we a European nation? Um, or are we, and you'll have heard 
Boris Johnson talking about global Britain. Are we a world power? Um, are we European or are we Atlanticist? Should our main ally be the United States or should we, as Edward Heath um, wanted to do in the 1970s, go full hearted into uh, the European uh, common market or community as it was then uh, and the union. And those tensions are rubbed up against each other all the way through. And at points we found um, a certain balance. And I would argue during our membership of the EU, we found a long uh, period of balance. But the tensions have always been apparent in, this, in the swings. And, you know, one of the things that struck me as I wrote the book, and I have a chapter on this, is the uh, you know, part of our economic history since the war is a procession of sterling crises. Uh, and against those sterling crises, you can map our retreat from our overseas, um, first from empire, but then from the Commonwealth and then from uh, the military bases that until the end of the 1960s, we had in places far away as um, Singapore, uh, Malaya, uh, etc. Um, and I, in trying to write this story, I suppose I divide uh, the period up into three parts. Uh, the first part is from uh, 1945 uh, to Suez uh, in 1956. And Suez, by Suez, I mean the Anglo-French um, operation, expedition, ill-fated, misjudged expedition to try and reclaim the Suez Canal uh, from the Egyptian leader uh, Nasser in 56. And during that period from 45 to 56, uh, this was the age, I think, of delusion, or uh, illusion, delusion, when we still um, imagined we were uh, an empire and that the setbacks we'd faced economically in the war were setbacks and that we would bounce back. And, you know, Churchill had sat down with them. Um, with Roosevelt and uh, Stalin at Yalta to map the Europe after the war. He'd sat down with Truman uh, and Stalin at Potsdam. We were one, and this was a favorite phrase of the times, we were one of the big three. We were a great power. Um, and we imagined, you know, as I said, that, you know, even, even after we uh, gave independence to India in 47, that really, you know, our ingenuity, our industrial strengths um, would bring us back uh, to the top table. Um, and the danger, uh, I start the book with my favourite quote from, from the whole period. And this was from a, a scientist in Whitehall, um, a chap called Henry Tizard, who'd worked for Churchill uh, during the war. And in 1949, um, he gave a warning to his colleagues. And it's a warning um, that uh, that should be echoing around Whitehall even as we speak. And I'm going to look to quote it now. He, what Tizard said, he wrote in a minute, he said, we're not a great power and we never will be again. We are a great nation. But if we continue to behave like a great power, we will cease to be a great nation. And there, I think in that quote, you have this central tension between our uh, not being uh, not being able to give up our history uh, history is a global imperial power uh, and face the future now that period came to an abrupt end with Suez um, Anthony Eden then prime minister and his um, French counterpart sent in the troops uh, militarily it was quite successful the trouble is that we hadn't told the Americans in fact we'd lied to the Americans about it. In fact, Eden had lied to most of his own party and to the House of Commons about the whole thing. Uh, the Americans told us to stop. Um, they voted for the only time in the Second War in, sec in history uh, with the Soviet Union in the United Nations against Britain. The whole world united against Britain and France. Um, and the Americans showed demonstrated their power by basically blocking off access to foreign currency assets um, to the British government and sterling began to fall and the Americans blocked off access to central bank and IMF funding. 
and we ran away. We we had to surrender and we came back. And that was the period that we, that was the point where most people, not everyone, but most people thought, look, we need to think about a slightly more modest place in the world rather than uh, our old imperial role. And so we got to the second phase in this, um, in this period where we said, okay, we'll throw our lot in with the Americans. Uh, and Macmillan, who'd actually, uh, who took over from Eden, who was forced to resign, had served with Eisenhower in North Africa in the Second World War. And he coined then this phrase about Britain should act as Greece to America's Rome. And what that meant, which was a rather, it's a very rather self-serving and rather um, condescending uh, uh, phrase. It meant that we would be the smart Greeks who understand how the world works. They will be the rather dumb Romans and we will exercise our power by being the closest ally of the US and whispering in the ear of US presidents about really what they should do. And this is what Macmillan decided when he became prime minister in 57, we would rebuild something that uh, Churchill had evoked in his famous uh, Iron Curtain speech after the Second World War, the special relationship uh, with the US. And we dressed this up with all sorts of emotional uh, baggage, you know, the ties of kit and kin, culture, history, language. Uh, and uh, for a few years, this was the, um, and it was this decision that made us rather uh, turn our noses up at the idea of a common market when uh, leaders of the six met or representatives of the six met first in Messina uh, and then in Brussels in 1955 and 56 to create the common market. Um, Churchill had said uh, rather pejoratively of, of the rest of Europe that um, of course um, we are with Europe um, but we're not of it. Uh, the idea was that we could stand one step apart. Uh, so we ignored um, ignored the common market, set up our own alternative uh, European free trade area, EFTA, uh, with small and uh, Scandinavian countries. Now, this worked in, in, the, in, respect, in respect that we did build a very close relationship with the US, carrying on the relationship from the from the war and the, and the very close links in our intelligence services and militaries. And if you like, it was cemented by a deal in 1962 under which Kennedy agreed to sell us Polaris nuclear uh, missile or the nuclear the missiles uh, for our nuclear warheads. Um, uh, a deal that has survived since and, and you know, our nuclear deterrent um, uh, now is the is Trident, which is basically uh, the follow through from uh, Polaris. So we built this nuclear relationship. Now we call it an independent deterrent. Um, anyone who reads my book will discover that it's not quite independent at all, um, but uh, uh, it's, it cemented the relationship with the US. But as we did that, we began to realize that this common market and the French and the Germans were doing rather well. Uh, the German economy had recovered enormously fast. The French economy was growing very fast. Um, and the Italian economy industrially was growing very fast. And um, it became obvious that um, we might be left behind in Europe. Macmillan's, the best and the brightest in Macmillan's government uh, decided that um, uh, being frozen out of this common market in the long term would mean we were left aside from the main power blocks. Back then, the power blocks were seen as the Soviet Union, the United States, China even then was seen as an emerging power block. And it now looked as if the common market would join them. And the British, uh, having decided we were above uh, the Europeans now, uh, thought we had to join them. That took 10 years because de Gaulle um, uh, blocked us twice. Uh, charging that we were um, a Trojan horse for the Americans. But by 70, 
three we were in. And I would argue this actually answered Atchison's question in a way. We'd found a role. And the role was that we would be America's closest ally and rely on America for our security, but we would also play an active economic and political role uh, in Europe, in our own continent. And that seemed to me, those two pillars seemed to me to uh, create a decent architecture for our foreign policy. Uh, and that architecture lasted until Brexit. I mean, it was very, it wasn't terribly stable sometimes. We had prime ministers who railed against um, Europe. Margaret Thatcher wanted her money back. Um, and we had the row over Maastricht as Europe um, uh, pressed ahead with the single currency. Uh, and we had all the way through this sense of um, exceptionalism, uh, this worry about sovereignty that, uh, other countries uh, didn't have. And politically, being part of the European Union was always more difficult for us than most other nations because there was never really a political consensus across both parties. If you look at the history of our membership, when one of the main parties was pro-Europe, the other tended to be anti. So it became a, a, an issue of contention at general elections. Uh, and the like. But uh, again, I would say here was, a, here was a structure that basically worked. We were much more influential. One of, again, the, one of the tragedies of our, of, of our European journey was that we never really recognized how influential we were in Brussels. The single market, of course, was pushed very hard by um, Thatcher's government. Enlargement of the EU was very much a British project during the 1990s, uniting, you know, Thatcher, Major, and Tony Blair. Uh, but we never really claimed these as victories. We were too um, busy. We had a media um, that uh, uh, really uh, couldn't accept a, a European destiny for us. And we had Rupert Murdoch constantly sniping and attacking governments who were seen to be giving in uh, to the Europeans and we had this essentially difficult period. I would argue, and I'm not going to go into the sort of run up to Brexit, I would, have, I would argue strongly that um, with a bit of more political leadership, um, we could have uh, weathered the particular uh, storms, uh, but we didn't. And we left, and now we have left, we are back to where we were in 1962, when Atchison stood up at the West Point uh, Military Academy and said, Britain has lost an empire and failed to find a role. Because Boris Johnson told us, we're now part of global Britain. Uh, and it's a meaningless phrase. It's, it has as much meaning as when Theresa May um, when she became prime minister said, Brexit means Brexit. Uh, global Britain uh, means nothing uh, unless we are going to um, uh, reimagine uh, the post-imperial world. And, and if we conjure up resources that have never uh, been available uh, for us since the war, uh, then we are going to have to recognize the realities of Britain and the world, and those realities are very simple. Uh, we are part of Europe, um, geographically and economically and politically. Uh, we should be and are uh, in strong alliance with the United States, and we should and will, I hope, have a global perspective, which uh, takes into account our history. Um, but we can't be, as Tizard, the civil servant I mentioned, we can't be a great power again. And as long as we keep trying to be a great power, global Britain, the best of in the world, um, we will risk seeking to be a great nation. And I'll end there. I hope Thank that you gives you some sense of the book. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. That was a very wide ranging and, and, and very stimulating and, and interesting. Um, 
you, ma you mentioned at various stages, you, you mentioned uh, the names of various people. Um, it's always struck, I, I was struck at the time I was in, in the UK, uh, when Britain was playing a very big role in the treaty, which eventually emerged uh, in that decade. Um, a very big role indeed, and yet British politicians, including the then Prime Minister, uh, uh, Tony Blair, they never claimed the victories. I mean, Britain had a huge role in things like, as you mentioned yourself, the single market, in pressing for enlargement. But it always seemed to me that when British politicians came back from meetings in which they had been successful, they never claimed successes. They always pointed out the little bits that they didn't get. So how do you explain that? I don't know. There, there, there are sort of two currents in our relationship with, 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 the, with Europe. One is a sense of superiority. We're better than they are. And this other, this sense of what you, you're, you're, you're mentioning, is insecurity. You know, they're out, they're going to gang up on us. They're out to do us down. They're out to rob us of our, you know, sovereignty and freedom. And I think, it, you know, I think in significant part, it was because it's because of, you know, our perception of ourselves as uh, different. Also because it's been a political, as I said, football. Also, I think probably what marks us out as different, and we are, you know, there are real differences between Britain and other, particularly continental, um, the other continental members, is that while most countries joined the EU with a real purpose in mind, if you're French or German, it was about reconciliation, with Germany, it was about legitimate, you know, re-establishing legitimacy. If you're French, it was about re-establishing French political leadership. Um, we joined because we felt we had to. Sort of, we took a rather instrumentalist view of it. We didn't join with any great enthusiasm. We joined because if we didn't join, we'd be left out. Uh, and I, you know, in the book, I say I think there are two big moments where where the opportunity was lost to, to change that. One was in 79, um, when Thatcher won, won a big majority. Um, she could have uh, sat down with Giscard and Schmidt as the, as the two were and said, okay, let's the three of us run this show. You know, let's establish this as a, uh, and she could have cemented, I think, um, uh, Britain into a sort of, into a sort of troika at the top of the EU. And I think Tony Blair could have done exactly the same in 97. Uh, and in fact, he, Thatcher didn't. She decided she wanted to get the money back, um, argued the, the budget, and she argued about the budget for four years. Um, uh, Blair, I think, in 97, did think in terms of, you know, let's make us a really influential player who can claim, which, that can claim successes. Um, but that ran into the sand, I'm afraid, with um, with you know 9/11, Iraq, uh, and the rest of it. And that was, I think, the, that was probably the biggest lost opportunity because here was a prime minister with a huge majority, um, with the personality and political presence to change the weather. He could have said, "Look, all this being defensive about Europe." stuff is nonsense we have to be you know we have to sing our, our successes and we have to do these things uh and in the end he was pulled by the americans and he you know there was this false choice again you know do i go with with george w bush or do i go with the europeans and um in the end he um i remember him saying to, this to me personally you know it's my duty uh to be with the americans yeah yeah. Difficult choices. Yeah. Do you have any idea as to why David Cameron didn't really um, put his heart into the yes referendum? The, the, the impetus was with the, the Leave group from the very beginning, and there seemed to be no campaign or no serious campaign on the Remain side. Why, why, why did he do that? 
I think um, one of his officials said to me about Cameron um, soon after he became um, prime minister, the two things actually, um, one of which was that um, it's very disobliging. It was out, really out of a out of a, a, an episode of um, Yes Minister that um, Cameron had been um, prime minister for three, four months by then. And we were having lunch with an official and I, I was just asking him about how Cameron worked, you know, how, what was the rhythm of the number 10, you know, and not, there were no great secrets being exchanged at this lunch. And then I said at one point, um, what does Cameron think about the world? And this um, very English uh, civil servant looked at me and said, well, I'm afraid the prime minister thinks the world is somewhere where you go on holiday. <laughs> Which is about the most damning thing <laughs> you could say. Well, it's so damning. I, I didn't use it. But I thought it was, I thought it was so, actually it turned out to be true. He had no interest in the world, foreign affairs, whatever. You know, he had his little run with Sarkozy in Libya and whatever, but he, he he's absolutely uninterested in the world. And that tells the other part of the story, the same official told me, was that he'd never failed anything in his life. Cameron went to, you know, was born in a wealthy family, went to a smart prep school where he succeeded, where he got into Eton, where he succeeded, got into Oxford, got a first class degree, got a job as a Conservative Party advisor straight away, was successful as a ministerial advisor, got, got a job in the commercial sector, which was arranged, you know, these things are arranged, successful as that. But, so every part, and he had come to believe that, that if he wanted to do something, he could do it. Mm. You know, it's, the Scottish referendum was the same. In that, in, you know, 2014, he had sort of, you know, well, don't worry, you know, we'll, we'll get through it. And actually there was one week where he realized that they might not and they had to actually do something. And I'm sure with, and I've talked to people who were there, he just thought, you know, in the end, you know, the British people will listen to sensible people like me um, and vote to stay. Uh, and now the, there were other complications in this, you know, in that you had a, a Labour Party leader who was actually probably more on the leave side than on the remain side. And you had some miscalculations that Cameron made about Johnson and Gove and, um, but the basic, basic, um, I would say, fault was to just assume I can wing it. You know, I've, I've always done it before. Um, you know, it's the sort of midnight essay. I'll start the, you know, I'll do it. It'll be fine. I was very taken by Craig Oliver's uh, book about the, about the campaign, where there's hardly a mention of either Northern Ireland or the Republic of Ireland. Yeah.